Welcome to Money Talk Viewpoint, the podcast for financial professionals, CPAs, estate planning lawyers, high net worth individuals, and those who service high net worth individuals. My name is Stuart Cruz. I'll be your host today. I am the president and founder of Cruz Asset Management. We're a boutique asset management firm and virtual family office. For those of you who don't know Cruz Asset Management, we work with high net worth individuals. We do this by investing using quantitative uh, methodologies and we are a fiduciary, so we don't get paid for selling any product. We run a virtual family office, which is basically like a team-based approach to managing and optimizing your wealth. So wouldn't you rather have any financial professionals working together instead of in isolated silos? And that's one of the reasons why we have our guest on today, Chris Shumate. He is a um, he is a uh, state planning attorney, and he has other state planning attorneys. He is um, trying to go down the path of providing a, a variety of additional services to his clients instead of just being one and done, right? So the idea of a virtual family office is that we have financial professionals working together in conjunction with each other on a team-based approach and not in a you know competitive environment because you're going to tend to get better solutions when you're working together. So let me introduce my guest, Chris Shumate. Um, he is, he graduated from the Fowler School of Law. He worked for the Riverside County District Attorney as a prosecuting uh, lawyer. Then three years later, he joined Albertson's Law Firm as an estate lawyer, which we're going to get into a little bit on uh, why he made the switch. He has a BA in Poli Sci and Philosophy from the University of California, Riverside. And he's been working with Cruise Asset Management's virtual family office to provide his clients with additional services just beyond his own trust work. So very happy to have Chris on the show today. Um, so Chris, let me, uh, well, first of all, welcome to the show. Stuart, thanks for, uh, thanks for having me. So first off, I am super curious how you went from being a prosecuting attorney to an estate planning lawyer. Like, what was that transition like? Yeah, so um, I, uh, um, Kind of in a former life, um, I was a, I was a deputy DA with Riverside County, and so um, that was uh, basically being the prosecutor, uh, put people um, in prison for a living. And so the story there is that when um, I went to law school, um, I was uh, getting a um, uh, uh, what they called a certificate, which is like a major in uh, in tax um, in law school. And um, I'd always, uh, you know, kind of been, uh, you know, um, stood in um, public speaking and um, uh, speech and debate, uh, acting, things like that. And I'd always thought about um, going and being a DA. And so when I uh, graduated from uh, law school, there was an opportunity, uh, uh, an opening for me to um, be a DA. And so um, I decided to go ahead and take that opportunity and, uh, and step into it. So backing up a little bit, my uh, my mother-in-law uh, is Kathleen Albrechtson, and so um, she is a uh, and was at the time an estate planning and probate attorney. And we had always talked about you know potentially going into practice together uh, to kind of have a uh, a family type office, and. Um, uh, but when the you know opportunity came for me to become a, a, a DA, I just decided to go ahead and 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 so was very um, uh, grateful for my time um, as being a DA. Um, I uh, prosecuted um, uh, 21 jury trials uh, through jury verdict uh, within those three years. Um, was uh, constantly uh, in uh, in trial. And uh, I worked with some of the best litigators in the state of California uh, in that office. So got really great, valuable trial experience. At the time, I had three very young kids um, and uh, my wife was uh, managing our family and I was, you know, gone most of the time. Um, and, uh, you know, being a DA does not lend itself to being a, um, you know, dad of young kids. And so I was often, you know, up, you know, all through the night preparing for trial, or I was out at some, you know, uh, homicide scene, uh, you know, overnight, um, or times where we would, you know, go out 
uh, we headed up to the beach and then I would get a phone call and have to turn the car around and go back to the office uh -huh. or um, the very last trial that I was on um, you know my we had this trip that we were going to and uh, I got pushed out to trial and uh, my wife had to go on the trip alone and so uh, um, it, it just it, it, it just didn't have a good uh, good family life and so um, you know people that succeed and thrive well in that office are people that you know are um, willing to you know kind of put the job first um, at all times and so I'm grateful for my time there um, uh, had a lot of uh, just great colleagues uh, that I got to work with, but uh, after uh, after three years, I just kind of decided that uh, I needed to make a switch. And so then that's when I started talking with uh, Kathleen again about um, you know partnering up. What we did in 2008, and so uh, then we made our partnership official, and we uh, created uh, Albertson and Shoemate. And so that's where we are today. Wonderful. So. Yeah. Um, I noticed you have the philosophy degree. My wife is also a lawyer with a philosophy degree, turned you know, lawyer, law professor. So, what is it about that philosophy degree that, that like lends itself to lawyers? And, and yeah, I you, actually, I actually have a, um, I have a BA in prosecuting or with your estate planning lawyer side. So, uh, what I would say is, is that I have a BA with uh, political science, and then I have a minor in philosophy. Um, I, I really, um, I really loved philosophy. Philosophy was probably my most favorite uh, subject in um, in college. Um, it was definitely the most rigorous classes that I took um, when um, I was at UCR. Um, the there is is that I would I had planned on double majoring um, at uh, UCR in both political science and philosophy. Um, but um, I had met my, you know, soon-to-be wife at the time, and decided that it would be better to graduate early, get married to her, and uh, take the minor instead of the major. So that, you know, that's how, that, that's how that ended up. But um, as far as to answer your question, yeah, philosophy um, does a great job of, you know, training um, uh, your mind to think about logic and uh, to uh, think through things in a, in a very systematic way. Um, and so I would say that it lends itself just being a lawyer in general, um, uh, the whole process of going through law school um, and um, uh, um, becoming an attorney, I think is, uh, I think philosophy is a good background for that. Yeah. All right, well, let's have a state planning question. So, um, you know, when we were talking before the show, you said what's going to be valuable to the audience, and of course we want to handle these things. So I think everybody has a pretty good understanding of what estate planning would be for. You're trying to reduce estate taxes and, and deal with situations after somebody's passed away and avoid probate court, and those, things, those kind of things. What are some misconceptions, some very common misconceptions that people have about um, what an estate planning lawyer can or cannot do. Yeah, so um, probably a uh, the the number one misconception is is that um, uh, uh, preparing a will uh, helps you avoid probate, and that is not true. Um, so having a will is a great start. Um, uh, it uh, tells the court, you know, who you want to be in charge and where you want your assets to go. Gives you some control over, you know, your uh, your die, but it does not help you avoid the probate process. And just to, you know, you know, make sure that everybody's on the same page. I'm a California attorney, and so I deal with, you know, um, California uh, estate planning clients and California decedents. And so, um, unfortunately, the status in here in California is, is that uh, California has a uh, um, overly bureaucratic uh, probate process. And so probate is the process of transferring assets from the person that died to the beneficiaries and heirs. Um, in California, that process for an uncontested estate um, takes about a year and a half to two years. And it usually costs somewhere between fifteen to $30,000 in costs and fees. 
And so most people want to avoid that for their children or their beneficiaries. Most people don't want to require that, you know, when, when they die, that their children have to go through this long, expensive court. So when we talk about avoiding probate, that's really the, the, the reason or the, the, the main thing behind it. Yeah, it's, uh, I'm in Illinois, outside of Chicago, or actually, I'm sorry, downtown Chicago. And it's a similar case where it takes a good year and a half, two years to get through probate court, in my experience. And so one of the number one things that I recommend is whenever I see somebody that does not have an estate plan in place, and they're just like, oh, I have to take care of a will. And it's just not, it's not enough. You're not going to yeah. want your, your um, beneficiaries and your heirs to go through this at all. Yeah. So to follow up on that, just to, again, just make sure that, you know, we're all on the same page and kind of laying the kind of the basic framework is, is that that's why people um, here in California and, and, and maybe also in Illinois, um, that's why they um, when they go to an estate planning attorney, that's why typically we're talking about setting up a trust. And so um, you want to think of it kind of like this bucket. You know, you create this bucket, you put all of your assets into this bucket. And then when you die, the bucket doesn't die. It's just new people come alongside to manage it and distribute it according to whatever the trust says. So that's how a trust works, and that's how it helps you avoid probate. Yeah, exactly. Um, let's see. What, um, I know there's some tax laws being sunsetted in 2026. So are there, in, of course, the estate planning uh, thresholds or the, the estate exemption thresholds are being dramatically reduced? Are there... Maybe we can go into some of that, but are there any other things that are uh, tax loss changes in the future that are coming up that are going to be pretty dramatic or drastic that we need to be aware of? Well, from an estate planning point of view, I think that the um, estate tax potential sunset in 2026 is probably the most dramatic thing. Yeah, so, so um, go ahead. It goes from like 12, 12 million-ish or so per person. And it gets cut down to a five million per person plus um, a, a calculation for uh, inflation, right? So it'll end up being around six million per. Um, yeah. So um, just so that again, everybody's you know kind of um, on the same page and they understand uh, what we're talking about. So estate tax is the um, is a federal tax. It's different than probate. Estate tax is a federal tax that your heirs and beneficiaries have to pay within nine months of a person's death. And so currently the estate tax exemption is at, um, I believe, $13.6 million. Okay. And so you can die with $13.6 million without incurring any estate tax, um, any type of transfer tax or anything like that. Um, in the, the way that the law is currently written is um, in um, 20, 1st of 2026, then the current law sunsets, uh, meaning the exemption amount uh, sunsets, and it goes back to the previous law, which is uh, from the Obama administration. Um, and um, so the inflation that we think is going to, um, the inflation adjustment that we think is going to happen if it does sunset will um, go to uh, $7 million. So we, th we think, that if it sunsets, it's going to be we're going to be left with a seven million dollar exemption. Now, what's important to um, think about is is that estate taxes has never gone down. Uh, the estate tax exemption has never gone down. So we were at a, a six hundred thousand dollar exemption amount in you know the eighties and nineties. Uh, we got up to a million uh, when we crossed into two thousand, and then it's just kind of been going up and up and up. And so um, trying to read the tea leaves and trying to, you know, guess as far as what's going to happen in 2026, I don't know. But it all has to do with Congress and uh, Capitol Hill and everything that is going um, on up there. And the last time that there was, um, or I, I think actually two times ago, that there was uh, this um, uh, legislation that was passed, it was passed, you know, on, you know, 1201, you know, uh, December 31st, midnight session of Congress. And that's probably what's going to happen if there's going to be an extension or an increase in the estate tax exemption. We're probably not going to know about it until, you know, December 31st uh, at midnight 
uh, because these things tend to just kind of get put off to the end and uh, and passed the very last minute. Yeah. Congress is good that way, huh? Yeah. To worry about avoiding a government shutdown now, then they got to worry about the state tax. So they always seem like they're putting well, on fires. The estate tax really is is kind of a low priority tax for um, for Congress. I mean, it doesn't bring in that much revenue. Like if you think about the income tax, the income tax brings in trillions and trillions of dollars in revenue for um, for the federal government. But the estate tax really just you know it it, it brings in maybe tens of billions of dollars. That sounds like a lot. But, you know, when you got a federal budget that's, you know, five, seven million, seven trillion dollars or something like that, you know, um, you know, tens of billions of dollars just really isn't that big of a deal. Barely a rounding error. Right. What's that? It's, it's barely a rounding error. At that right. Point. Exa exactly. Wasn't there one year, it seemed like it was probably like 10 years ago, where they, the exemption went down to zero? Like if you died, there was no state tax? Yeah, so that was 2010. Um, and so that was another, um, you know, provision where, you know, the estate tax was going up, up, up. And then in 2010, it was um, done away with entirely. And then in 2011, it went down to a million dollars. And so, you know, everybody thought, OK, well, we're going to, you know, we're going to have this year where we're going to have no estate tax. And then we're going to go back down to a million dollars It's going to sunset. And that's just a great example of, you know, we got to December of 2010, and sure enough, it didn't sunset. Congress, you know, extended the estate tax exemption another two years, and then in 2013, we had the fiscal cliff legislation, and that, you know, extended it and raised it some more. And so, yeah, in 2010, there was no estate tax. That was very historic, and so there are a lot of wealthy, um, you know, uh, billionaires that uh, died in 2010, and their estates uh, suffered no estate tax. So that was a windfall. Yeah, for sure. Um, so there's a Bitcoin's been on a rise recently, so it's hit all-time highs in the last couple of weeks. Um, it seems to go through these gigantic fluctuations. Probably dropped. I think the number is in the last I don't know five to ten years. It's lost fifty to eighty percent of its value eight times now, and then rebounded at a higher rate every single time. So as of yesterday, it was sixty-nine thousand per Bitcoin which was higher than it was at the last high. Do these digital currencies provide or pose an added challenge to estate planning for you? Yeah, uh, cryptocurrencies are, um, you know, difficult for um, from an estate planning point of view. Um, you know, I'm not an expert in the area. I don't own any cryptocurrency, uh, but I have clients uh, that uh, um, obviously own it from time to time. And so um, cryptocurrency is, you know, owning, you know, cash under the mattress, you know, it, or old owning, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, gold bars, you know, under the bed or something like that. You know, whoever holds, you know, the thing, you know, owns it. And so if you get robbed, um, you know, and somebody, you know, walks away with all your gold bars or you get robbed and somebody walks away with all the cash under the mattress, then they own it, you know? Um, and so um, the same thing with cryptocurrency, like there's no good way of, you know, titling, you know, an interest uh, in a person's name, at least from what I know. And so whoever holds that key or the fog or whatever it is that, you know, gets you the, the wallet, that gets you the access to the cryptocurrency, that person, uh, that person owns it, uh, regardless of whether or not they were the, you know, legitimate owner. So um, it's from that perspective, it makes me nervous because, you know, um, I like to have, you know, everything titled in the name of a trust. I'd like to have, you know, okay, these bank accounts are all, you know, in the name of the trust. These brokerage accounts are all in the name of the trust. These real estate is all owned in the name of the trust. To my knowledge, there's no real good way of having cryptocurrency in the name of a trust. And so, if you have a, you know, nefarious, you know, beneficiary or family member who decides, you know what, I'm going to rip off, you know, dad or grandpa or something like that, and I'm going to take their key right after they die, then, you know, they 
legitimately, you know, own that, you know, cryptocurrency and they can do with it whatever they want. There's really not, not a lot of recourse as far as, uh, you know, going after them for it. Stuart, you probably know a little bit more about this than I do. Am I correct in uh, in my assumptions? Um, well, yes. If you're just owning the straight Bitcoin, you're exactly right. It's, you just need that key. Now, you can own Bitcoin now through ETFs and hold them in, let's say, Coinbase accounts and other wallets. And so you're, you would have to be registered under that account name. It would be very challenging to for somebody to step in to a Coinbase account and just take it over without anybody knowing. But if you so just that, you actually own the actual digital currency and you kept it off, you know, off one of the brokerage houses, then yes. Got it. So there, there are so the brokerage houses are kind of like Schwab or TD Ameritrade or something like that. And so um, you, you open an account in Coinbase, kind of the same way that you would in Schwab or uh, or some other brokerage. Yeah. So in that case, you could actually title it in the name of a trust, and it becomes a little bit more um a little bit easier to to deal with so i don't want to put you on the spot and and i want to be clear we're not recommending anything illegal that said it's almost sounded like i just find this topic interesting because i've had clients throughout the my course of history try to circumvent certain things in the past so like if somebody had a bunch of gold bars in their in their basement, you know, in their ceiling, in their safe or what have you. And it wasn't like the, the, the dad said, hey, just take these gold bars and go. What are the, let's, let's approach it with the legal part. Maybe you don't know the, even the, know the answer, but I'm just curious. What are, what are the dangers of that? Of somebody just grabbing these gold bars. What if they get caught? I mean, it, like if they, they get first prosecuted by the law, who's going to prosecute them? Like what's the, have you ever seen a case like that where that's actually happened and somebody just took them? Maybe yeah, so extra gold bars or any of these things and what happened? I've had um, a case where somebody's walked off with, uh, inappropriately walked off with um, cash or, or gold bars, but you know, uh, gold bars and cash, it's just a tangible personal property. It's the same as, uh, you know, Artwork that's on the wall, or um, uh, you know, the the desk, or um, you know, uh, pots and pans, or whatever. And so, um, it's just valuable. Uh, there's a market for it. You can sell it. Um, and so, um, uh, you know, pots and pans you're going to be able to sell at a, um, a, a at a at a garage sale. Uh, but you know, gold bars and uh, cash, you know, has a has a ready market, and it's much more valuable. And so. Um, you know, you can be prosecuted the same way that you steal anything. I mean, um, uh, so it's still, you know, theft. Uh, if you, you know, um, uh, break into somebody's home, it's, it's um, and so, um, you know, you can still, you know, call the police and, uh, you know, have the person um, uh, prosecuted. Um, and so if somebody um, uh, steals a whole bunch of uh, gold bars, you can, you um, uh, sue that person in civil court uh, for uh, for theft, uh, you know, uh, conversion, um, and you know, a host of other you know uh, civil um, uh, actions. Uh, but the issue is is that um, you know it's it's not insured, it's not backed by a bank. You know, if you have somebody who's walked off with a whole bunch of cash or a whole bunch of um, uh, Precious metals, then you know what's your um, what's your remedy? Uh, you know these people. You know other than arresting them and putting them in jail, getting a felony or a misdemeanor. You know these people that you know would uh, you know accomplish these types of acts usually aren't. Um, you know they don't have assets themselves in order to um, uh, to to pay the estate back or pay the trust back. Um, and so then it's a uh, matter of trying to get the gold bars or the uh, precious metals back or the cash back. And usually by the time that you find out about it, it's gone. Yeah. So. Um, so, yeah, that I mean, that's why um, it, it, it definitely has a, an element of risk 
by um, owning those types of assets, particularly owning those types of assets in your home, is because if you do get um, burgled um, uh, uh, and somebody um, walks off with them, it's really hard to get uh, made a whole unless you have some maybe insurance policy or something like that, uh, that's that risk. But um, yeah. So, you know, a lot of times we're finance, we just deal with the cold hard facts. Um, and normally in my world, I don't have a lot of, uh, a lot of emotional swings that I have to deal with unless the market's crashing. And even then it's not usually horrible, horrible. Um, but given that your whole job revolves around the potential thought of somebody dying or has just died, it's obviously extremely emotionally charged. So can you talk a little bit more about your experience there? How have you handled some of those emotional aspects of estate planning with the, you know, the, the grieving family or, or you're talking about the demise of somebody and coming face to face with their own mortality? Sure. So, um, you know, a death of a loved one is, uh, you know, um, uh, extremely emotionally um, uh, rocking event uh, for the family. And so um, anybody who's uh, listening to this or, um, you know, and has experienced a, a loved one die, you know, knows kind of the, the, the gravity of uh, what that loss can be like. I was, um, uh, my dad died in uh, 2018, and I was, you know, amazed by, you know, just how uh, difficult that was for me um, uh, emotionally, um, uh, just processing, you know, my dad's death, not only, you know, right after it happened, but uh, you know, months and months and months uh, after it happened as well. And so um, what that experience has taught me is just, you know, how difficult it is for families when they come into my office and they're dealing with the death of a parent, sibling, or sometimes the death of a child. Um, and so I always try to, you know, in a certain way, kind of put myself in their shoes and remember back, you know, how difficult it was for me when I had uh, my dad die. And so, um, you know, a lot of times, um, you know, when they're meeting with me, um, you know, it, it, it's hard for them to, you know, put everything, uh, you know, put everything together in an organized uh, way. You know, a lot of times there's, you know, kind of chaos that's going on um, and uh, they have um, a lot of questions from a lot of different topics. Um, and a lot of different uh, issues that they're facing. And because they're just kind of going through the, the trauma of uh, dealing with the death of this person, a lot of times they have to, um, you know, ask the questions multiple times, um, in, you know, uh, provide explanations, register. And so what I try to do is I just try to uh, be as patient as I can and um, uh, explain it as simply as I can. and um, uh, after somebody's died, uh, then a lot of times, uh, you know, it, it requires, you know, maybe, you know, multiple meetings with that person um, before it, you know, kind of sinks in as far as everything that I'm that I'm talking about. You know, this, the 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 issues that I deal with, you know, are complex. Um, uh, just the same way, Stuart, that the issues that you deal with are are complex in uh, um, uh, in the in, in your field, and so. On a good day, sometimes it's difficult for people to kind of wrap their head around everything that I'm talking about. But you compound that with, you know, the trauma of just losing a, uh, a loved one, and it becomes uh, uh, very difficult to kind of uh, digest everything. Yeah, it's for sure a hard part. I, you know, I, I have I have all my my parents and um, my wife does too. So we're I'm saying not looking forward to any of this coming. Everybody's happy and healthy so far. So, but eventually we all have to go through this. So it's going to be, you know, it's going to be a tough situation for everybody involved. But it's obviously better to plan for it ahead of time than to not plan for it. And then not only be dealing with these emotional uh, hardships, but then also be dealing with the legal and technical hardships of 
let's say probate court and a variety of other things. Right. I mean, what I can tell you is, is that if people put these plans in place in advance, it makes it so much easier for the family. I mean, it's, uh, it's not going to be easy um, in that, you know, dealing with the death of a, of a loved one and having to marshal the assets uh, and, uh, you know, uh, even if attorney in the state of California, you know, it, it's still going to be a diff still going to be a difficult situation. But you compare that to the chaos that people have to deal with when when there's no plan in place, when there has been no communication uh, with the with the um, children or the beneficiaries as to you know what they have, and they're just completely you know lost as far as you know what the next step is and how to you know even you know, wrap their head around, uh, you know, getting through this process. It's so much easier if the um, plans are put up, are, are put in place in advance. Yeah. Can you tell me some fun case studies you've had or circumstances that you've had where obviously it makes a difference every single time, but some, some, there's some outstanding cases that you can think of that just really, really thank goodness they went through this process when they did. Mm -hmm. I mean, it might yeah, be yeah. Some ones. Well, I mean, what I would say is, is that, um, uh, you know, we have, um, you know, basically three different areas to, um, to my practice. We have the estate planning practice, which is setting up the plans in advance. We have the trust administration um, end of our practice, which is um, administering the trust after um, somebody has died. And then we have the probate practice, which is um, basically dealing with estates when there has been no planning in place, and um, you know dealing with the with the court process um, uh, at that end. And so, so it seems like one of your arms is trying to put out a business, another part of your business, like your I mean, your trust formation business is trying to put out your probate business. Right. But the problem is, is that I'm never going to be able to do enough trust to get rid of the things because uh, there is uh, way more people that don't plan than there are people that plan. Um, but uh, yeah, that's a good point. I'm trying to, you know, kind of put myself out of business as far as the probate arm. But um, the, um, you know, what I, what I, um, what I can tell you is, is that dealing with trust administration, you know, there's certain, you know, challenges that always go into that. But uh, 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 from from my experience, there's just um, it's just so much easier for the family to deal with the administration of a trust out of court um, without the exorbitant fees, without the exorbitant waits in time. Uh, I was in court yesterday. I'm sorry, not yesterday, Monday. I was in court Monday morning. And uh, we were wrapping for probate. This was somebody that had died um, uh, a couple years ago. And um, my found an account um, a week before the the hearing, a week before the probate uh, was to close. Two and years so we, later. Yeah, two years later. So um, we had to scramble and um, you know update the inventory. Uh, amend the petition um, and, um, you know, get it filed. Well, you know, the court, the um, San Bernardino County Court, where, where I have a lot of my cases, you know, they're backed up. You know, everybody's still, um, you know, reeling from COVID, the pandemic, uh, great resignation. Everybody's retooling and um, trying to, you know, get their, you know, staff, you know, up to where it was before. Well, you know, the court, um, because it was a week before, the court didn't have, uh, didn't get the documents in time, uh, didn't have the documents in front of him uh, when, when the case was called. I had to verbally let the court know, you know, what had happened the week prior. And uh, the court said, well, I'm sorry, I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to hear your matter today. Uh, there's been too much that has happened. You know, if we have, you know, an updated inventory, I'm not going to be able to um, uh, hear the petition uh, today. So we're going to have to continue it. And you would think, oh, well, you know, that's sad, you know, uh, a continuance. Um, but, you know, at least the beneficiaries will get their money, you know, maybe in a, in a month or so. The court said that my earliest available um, uh, 
uh, date is uh, in the middle of August. So, you know, because we're we March found right for those because, who are going to do this podcast later, it's March right now. Yeah, it's March right now. So it's it's five months out. Just because we found an account that was, uh, um, you know, a week before the hearing. Yep. And the, the, the courts are backed up. There's not enough judges. There's not enough staff. And so dealing with the court and the court process is just um, usually an, an awful experience and is to be avoided. I mean, I don't have anybody at the end of a probate. I do. I do all the probates in the office. Um, and, you know, I'm a, I'm a specialist in the area. I never have a client at the end of a probate say, gee whiz, Chris, you know, you made that such a uh, such an easy process for us. Thanks so much. That never have that conversation. It's an awful process every single time. And we're good at it. If you don't have an attorney that knows what they're doing or you don't have an attorney at all, you know, that that one and that year and a half, to two years that I'm talking about, you know, that turns into five years if you're trying mm -hmm. to do it on your own. And so. Um, yeah, I mean, that's what I would say is, is that you don't want to deal with the um, stressed, uh, you, know, uh, you don't want to have to deal with the delays. You know, I had to go back to my office, tell the client, look, I tried everything that I could uh, in order to get the, um, uh, you know, matter heard that day. But, you know, unfortunately, everybody's going to have to wait, you know, five more months. And, you know, the client's not happy. The, you know, beneficiaries aren't happy. You know, they've already been waiting, you know, a year and a half or so, and now they, you know, figure out that, you know, it's going to be another five months just because the, um, you know, the court's backed up. So. Crazy. That's crazy. So how do you help the client balance between, and I get this a lot when I'm talking to my clients, um, how do you help them balance between having enough money for themselves and using the, themselves and leaving a legacy for their kids. Like most of the people they don't spend, like my dad says, I'm going to spend the last dollar, you know, in an ambulance on the way to the hospital to buy a hot dog. So I'm not going to get any, which is fine. But a lot of my clients are saying, I, I don't want to spend a lot of money. I want, or, they, or they're or they afraid that they're going to run out of money. So they don't want to give up certain control that might be beneficial for advanced state planning to give up control ahead of time. So how do you balance that? kind of push and pull that you have? Well, you know, I mean, that's really something that where I, I lean on, um, you know, uh, somebody like you, Stuart, uh, you know, to really, you know, um, advise the client as far as, you know, so you have these, you know, millions of dollars, you know, how much is it that you need to live on? You know, how much of it can you give away? I mean, advanced estate planning, dealing with estate taxes is really about just giving away your assets, either giving it away to charity or giving it away to your kids, doing it in a um, in a way that uh, will not uh, trigger uh, gift taxes or uh, um, uh, 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 generation skipping tra uh, transfer tax. Um, but, it's a, but, you know, if you're over the exemption amount, you know, the, 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 the way to um, minimize estate taxes is making sure that you don't end up, you know, dying with uh, more than the exemption amount. And so that really involves getting rid of the assets in some way. And so, um, uh, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's an issue where, um, you know, every family is different. Uh, there's the issue of, um, you know, dealing with the client's insecurities as far as, you know, trying to figure out how much money they need to um, hold on to. But then there's also the issue of, well, if I give this to my kids, then what's the, what is that going to do to, you know, the family? Um, you know, how much, do, um, you know, do I want to, you know, tie it up into, you know, some type of, uh, uh, you know, dynasty trust that goes on for, you know, um, uh, you know, tons of decades, or uh, do I want to give it to them, you know, outright, you know, um, will this, you know, money destroy my kids? Uh, will it, you know, cause them to leave the workforce and for them to have, you know, unproductive, unsatisfying lives, yeah. you know? And so the issue of, you know, whether to pay the tax or not, 
um, whether to, you know, give it away or not, you know, it's, it's, it's a, it's multifaceted. Um, uh, so part of it is dealing with, um, you know, how much do they need to live on, but also a big part of it is what's, what's in the best interest of the family. Yeah. So you brought up me as financial advisor. Um, what are the things that we could do to help with the process for you? Or that our clients should be thinking about, or we should be bringing up to our clients to make sure that they're well prepared. Of course, I inquire: Do you have a trust? Do you have a will? If I hear, oh, I just have a will, then we need to make some adjustments. But what else do we need to be doing to help make this process easier? Right. So, I mean, the main thing that um, uh, the main thing that uh, that's that's beneficial about somebody like you, Stuart, is is that um, you know, you are um, less transactional based than I am. And so from an estate planning attorney, um, it, you know, tends to be more transactional. Um, I'll see my client and then, um, you know, if they want to make updates, uh, then great. Then I'll see him again. But sometimes I don't see him for a long time. There's no um, yearly uh, meeting a lot of times uh, with uh, a lot of my estate planning clients. And so, you know, financiers really are, um, you know, kind of more on the front lines as far as, you know, really understanding year by year as far as what that client's going through and what their needs are. And so I really appreciate, um, you know, you, Stuart, and, you know, asking those questions. Well, you know, do you have, you know, a trust? Uh, you know, do you, um, are you thinking of, you know, issues related to estate taxes? Are you thinking about issues related to, you know, what you know you want to have happen with your wealth after you die um because you know oftentimes i'm sure you're what you would say is is that it takes you know more than one conversation to really convince a client to you know come in and see an estate planning attorney and actually move forward on it um so yeah so just continuing to have the conversation with your clients i think is the is, is the main thing um and then um you know, as far as uh, what is great about uh, having a uh, financial advisor when the plans are actually set up is that it allows um, it to be much less likely for there to be, you know, kind of oopses or, you know, things that are left out of the trust or left out of the estate plan that were done, you know, accidentally. Again, you know, as I said in the beginning, setting up a trust is like setting up a bucket. And so, um, you know, you want to make sure that everything is in your bucket. You don't want to have an empty bucket. And so, um, you know, I give clients instructions to say, look, you know, we're going to take care of all of the real estate for you, but it's going to be up to you to, you know, take care of these other things. If they have a financial advisor, then they are just so much better positioned to have somebody, you know, help them out with the other investments and the other assets as far as making sure that all those things get into the trust. Yeah. So this is all the rage, AI is all the rage. So how is it changing and affecting your business? Is it making things easier for you? Is it, I, I can't imagine you're feeling in danger of AI replacing you in any sense of the word, because as you said, everything's a unique strategy, but how is it helping your process, if at all? Yeah, um, that's a good question. I mean, AI, um, what I would say is, uh, Places maybe that it's it's helping the um, profession is is that it makes it so that um, finding legal research is easier, um, and so if I have to research an issue, it makes it a lot more likely that I you know can get to you know what that you know very you know fine uh, issue is that I'm dealing with in a particular fact pattern might be um, uh, versus you know when I started in law school you know we were you know, we still had, you know, reams and reams of books and you had to, you know, go through this big, long process of trying to figure out, you know, how to find a certain case that dealt with a certain. Um, it, uh, it It's definitely helping in as far as drafting goes, uh, making it so that it's a lot easier to um, uh, to draft documents and pleadings uh, for the court. Um, and, um, uh, you know, there's I, I don't have to deal with as much where I have, you know, staff re-reviewing things again and again to make sure that, you know, everything's perfect before it goes out the door. 
Um, and so there's a lot of tools uh, in AI that, uh, that, that can help with that. Um, other than that, I would say that AI is probably at its infancy. I'm sure that, um, you know, uh, um, AI over the next, you know, five years is going to um, be something that's going to be completely way more advanced than it is now. And so um, um, I think that, uh, that it's just going to, um, you know, the average attorney is just going to have a lot more uh, advanced tools at their disposal. Um, in uh, in practicing law, yeah, I feel like there's been a lot of analogies. Like with CPAs, there was questions when the spreadsheet was invented. Are CPAs going to go away? And of course, they're busier now than ever, right? Mm -hmm. And my feeling is, while AI can help manage money and and do research, that there's always people that are wanting to talk to somebody about what they think is going to happen and how that affects their very particular situation and what should be done about it. And I think it's going to, you know, that the, the thing that AI can't replace is being human with other human beings, right? So I think that's where you and I, we have a lot of interaction with other human beings. So it's definitely helped with the productivity on our side as well. Um, so I think we've clearly covered the biggest mistake somebody can make in estate planning is not planning for their estate, right? But particular things that have really stand out to you that people do and or not to tell on any other state planning attorneys, but are there things that you've seen other people do attorneys that you're like, oh, why, why, why did they do it that way? They, you know, what should people be aware of? So um, what uh, people should definitely be aware of is um, that the estate planning practice as it existed in uh, the nineties and the early two thousands is a lot different than the estate planning practice today. Um, so if you had a trust that was done in the 90s, um, even if it was done by a, a really good estate planning attorney, um, a lot of those practices are different today. Um, so in the 90s, we had this $600,000 exemption from estate taxes. And so one of the main issues for most estate planning attorneys was um, uh, helping avoid estate taxes uh, because all you needed was, you know, a life insurance policy, maybe, um, you know, a home or a 401k, and then all of a sudden you're over the exemption amount. And so um, estate taxes apply to, you know, more the common Joe, um, you know, back in the 90s. And so what estate planning attorneys did um, and what, you know, a lot of, you know, these kind of document prepare services um, you know, still do is uh, they just add a, as a matter of course created these AB trusts, and there are um, the way that an AB trust works is is that you want to you know go back to that bucket concept. Well, on the death of the first spouse, it's like there's a guillotine at the top of the bucket, and when the first spouse dies, the the guillotine comes down and splits the bucket in half, and half the assets get moved over into an irrevocable trust for the benefit of the surviving spouse, but the terms of that era fixed and what and the latitude as far as what the surviving spouse can do with that irrevocable trust is um is also uh restricted and so the advantage to that was <clears throat> is is that it maximized the estate tax exemption um uh and so if you had a six hundred thousand dollar exemption you could double up on the exemption and you could pass down 1.2 million dollars to the next generation without incurring any estate tax but that that issue has gone away. Uh, we're at a $13 million exemption right now. We have something called portability, where you can file an estate tax exemption and uh, port over any unused exemption amount. Um, and so the need to have these AB trusts just as a matter of course for the for the typical you know husband and wife who's been married forever, they have you know joint children um, that they um, uh, that they have together. Um, you know, it's just it's not necessary it is a, a burden for the uh, surviving spouse if they're left with one of these AB trusts. And so what I would say is um, you just want to make sure that these plans get updated. Um, obviously, life happens. You know, the, the plan that you have when, uh, you know, Johnny is seven is going to look very uh, different than when Johnny is 35. Um, but on top of that, 
you know, practices change, uh, estate tax laws change, uh, the probate code changes. And so you want to make sure that you have a trust that is updated um, uh, and um, doesn't have some of these, you know, outdated um, uh, issues going on. I think, it, and you'd even be surprised, I know from my own personal experience, we look back at our trust that we hadn't looked at for a while, and there were people named that were going to be executors and helping us out in various areas that weren't really in our life anymore. Right. And don't even really realize it. I mean, obviously, the cases are the ex-wife is still named, and some people don't want that to have happen, or some people do. Uh, but many amicable divorces I've had experience with, but not always. And so just taking a look every few how often do you think they should take a look at their trust you know what i would say is is that it's a good idea to you know dust it off and make sure you look at it probably every you know three years or so make sure that it still says you know what you want it to say uh what i tell clients when they um uh have estate plans through us is, is that you know if you haven't heard with us hadn't haven't heard from us in you know in five years then you know it's probably a good idea just to pick up the phone and give us a call just to make sure that there isn't any reason that you need to come in yeah that sounds great well i think when we covered a ton of material i really appreciate all the information you provided it was super helpful and learning experience for me and very valuable when i'm going to be entering my conversations so uh chris how can people get a hold of you uh, so the probably the easiest way to get a hold of me is uh, through our, so there's a uh, a place on the on our website where you can actually send a message um, uh, and so that's an easy way of getting a message to me and so our website is um, I'll say it and then spell it it's um, albshulaw.com so it's a l b is in boy s h u l a w dot com wonderful all right and of course if you can't figure out that spelling you can always reach Chris through me. And I can be reached at Stuart at CruiseAssetManagement.com and Cruise is K-R-U-S-E. We also have a YouTube channel at uh, YouTube at Cruise AM where we publish some quarterly market outlooks and some other uh, hopefully timely market information. So um, I've been your host. This has been my pleasure to host you on Money Talk Viewpoint. It's the uh, financial blog to for CPAs, state planning lawyers, high net worth, and those that service them. My name is Stuart Cruz. It's been a pleasure to host you. And as we say here at Cruz Asset Management, thank you so much, Chris. Thank you, Stuart. It's been a pleasure.